welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, on today's episode, Jennifer Farley and I talk about how the body can help us connect to parts and connect to self. We also talk about shamanism and its connection to IFS. I found this conversation fascinating, and I must have said that a million times, and I cannot wait to have Jen on again. I felt like this was a little bit of a teaser. So a heads up, we recorded this in April. It's being published in almost the end of May, and it's funny because so much has changed in that short period of time. We talk about, so Jennifer, Jen is in California and, you know, things happened a little bit faster in California than they did in the rest of the country. So we talk about mask wearing and taking your temperature and we're like laughing, like, that's so weird. Like we're confused and surprised by these concepts. And as I was editing that this week, I thought those don't seem confusing. They seem pretty normal right now, right? Like, yeah, they're going to take your temperature before you go to the doctor. Yeah, they're going to take your temperature before you go into a restaurant. And yeah, everyone's wearing masks. Like that sounds fairly normal. It's amazing that a month, six weeks ago, that was very abnormal. So it's just, I just wanted to say that because it was weird listening to that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what's what the next month holds. Um, but here, so I just want to give you a note about that. So here are a few highlights from the episode that I wrote in the show notes. I just thought they were really, really interesting. And we just cover so much information. So Jen talks about the use of movement as a psychological treatment intervention. She says that how you move and hold yourself reflects how you feel about yourself, how you relate to others, and how you experience the world. You can get to know parts of yourself by being curious about how that part exists, like how it shows up in your body when it's blended. Um, And she says, like, how do you carry yourself when that part is present? And I just thought that was such an interesting question and just such an interesting thing to begin to notice. Like, what is your posture like when you're in these part, when a a specific part that you're trying to get to know, like what's your posture like when you're in that part? Um, And then what is your part trying to communicate to you through your body? Um, I just love all those questions, like just really deepening your friendship and your connection with that, those parts that you're trying to, you know, trying to get to know and be curious about. One of the other things that she talks about is using movement to connect to qualities of self and even calling up qualities of self through movement and through your body. And then, you know, Jen, Jen does an amazing job of just answering my random questions because I ask her a lot of these questions just out of my own curiosity and off the cuff and she does an amazing job so we go into this whole thing about soothing rhythms because I talk about biting my nails and she just goes into this whole thing about our body's soothing rhythms and I think if you're a nail biter or a picker or a rocker or a leg shaker it just it's just really interesting so she talks about that I thought that was just fascinating and then so I originally wanted to talk to Jen about shamanism. Um, I know nothing about shamanism and, but I hear it coming, it comes up in, in webinars and at the conference, it comes up all the time and I know nothing about it. So that was my original intent of having her come on. And we actually only talk about shamanism um, from about the 40 minute, like, so we chat for a little bit, we talk about all the body stuff. And then about the 40 minute mark, we talk about shamanism for about 10 minutes. So, that's why we have to have her on again because it was so good. Jen offers individual shamanic healing virtually and integrated psychotherapy services to those in California. She also offers regular workshops and retreats. You can find all about her and read her Body Speaks blog, which is super interesting, at 
shamanhealingmonterey.com. And that links in the show notes. She also offers workshops in collaboration with Monterey Bay Meditation Studio. And they have a website to montereybaymeditation.com. One of my favorite things that she says is, can you let your parts know you are with them using a hand gesture of movement or emotion? And I loved that because I thought, how how often do you not have the words or you don't have the time maybe to go inside, but you could use a hand motion and then your parts would be used to knowing that that hand motion means that you're with them, that you see them. And I love that. Um, so don't forget to subscribe if you like the podcast. And I would really appreciate that if you subscribe to the podcast and if you wrote a review. And then, of course, if you shared it with your friends and family. And come say hi to me on Instagram at IFS Tammy. Join our community at the One Inside Facebook group. I would love to connect with you. Okay, enjoy this one. I think it's a good one. Hi. Hi. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. You were in, are you in California? I am. Yeah. Yeah. How was the weather in California this morning? Um, it's a bit uh, drizzly. We have this thing where I live called the marine layer where there's just kind of like a mist in the mornings um, that comes off the water and it and it just kind of burns off as the day goes on. So, um, oh my gosh, kind of neat, you know, a little like magical. <laughs> I love it. So, how close are you to the to the water, and what body of water are you close to? Um, so, I uh, live in a place. I live in Carmel, California, and my home is uh, fortunately like four or five blocks away from the water um, near the Pacific Ocean and Monterey Bay. Oh my gosh. So yeah, it's really lovely. Um, when I, when we go out on our patio, we can't see the water from our home, but you can hear the ocean. Um, and that's really soothing for sure. <laughs> for some reason, I want to start crying right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. That yeah. amazing. It's definitely uh, helped me uh, stay grounded and, and, uh, and connected to the positive for sure. And is that helping you, right? Definitely helping you more right now. Than, mm -hmm. Yeah. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how are you doing out there? Like what's, what's happening? Have you left your house at all? <laughs> um, so we're still sheltering in place and I pretty much, I, I do, I stay home. Um, the only, I, I left, I think a week ago to go grocery shopping and that was exciting. First did time. Did you wear a mask? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and everybody here is really um, is sticking to it and, and taking it seriously as far as really trying to not go out for anything but essentials. Um, we're, I think we're in this, I think they're going to reevaluate it in like the beginning of May or something like that and, and go yeah. from there. But. Yeah, they just, last night, our governor just... Um, said no they're not the kids aren't going back to school which we all kind of knew but um he just declared that declared it that sounds very official he <laughs> declared that yesterday so um which we all knew and then um yeah i did get a letter from my dentist office that said that they're gonna start doing some cleanings in the beginning of may Oh, interesting. I know. I was like, okay, but they're going to take your temperature before they, they're going to be in protective gear and they're going to take your temperature. I don't know. All right. I know. I thought, well, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> that sounds a little like, or it's, that still seems early to me. Like, I don't know that you should be doing that. I mean, I don't know, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. May, that's, that's only a couple weeks away. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, I mean, I know that, that that does sound early, but who knows? I mean, they must be onto something in terms of what's okay and what's not. Yeah. <laughs> I know here, I don't have children myself, but it, in California, I think pretty, I think the whole state they've canceled school for the whole year. 
Um, and are looking now at like the different summer camps and stuff that are offered and some of them have already been canceled and whatnot. Um, so I'm just trying to kind of go with it. And yeah, if, Jennifer if, and I are both just putting our hands in an I don't yeah. know motion. Like we're both going, I don't know. I don't know. And that actually is a great motion to be like, I don't know. Mm, I don't know. And it's kind of yeah. like, gives me like an, I, that feels actually really good. Like acceptance, like a radical acceptance. Of like, totally. I don't know. Mm, yeah. I don't totally. know. <laughs> now, do you like to go by Jennifer or do you go by Jen or Jenny or? Jen is fine. Jen. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I usually introduce myself Jennifer because people, if I say my name's Jen, they'll say Jan, Jane, Jen, <laughs> and Jean. Oh <laughs> um, so, but I love Jen. It's great. Isn't yeah. it funny how you're like, it's a really common name. Why are you messing it up? Yeah. It's Jen. <laughs> <laughs> and the more I really try to enunciate it, the more like awkward things get somehow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because they're probably like, if you're like, my name is Jen, then they're like, oh, it must be an unusual name. Right. Make it that way. So <laughs> I'm bracing for like, oh, what is it? <laughs> oh, gosh. So um, how has all of this affected your work? I'm, I'm doing pretty well, actually. So I'm doing all video uh, conferencing from my home and... Um, and just continue to see clients in that format. And, um, and it's gone pretty well so far. I mean, there are some people that are skeptical about um, doing any range of what I'm, what I offer via telehealth. Um, And most of the time I find that if I'm pretty confident in saying like, no, it's, it'll, be um it'll still be great and we'll still feel connected and you know I invite you to just give it a try that um once people do they're pleasantly surprised so for the most part it's gone pretty well good yeah um did you um are you working in an inpatient eating disorder unit or tell me about that or like a residential, oh, or is that something you did in the past? That is um, something that I did in the past. So okay. I um, was part of a eating disorder treatment facility. I worked there for seven or eight years. Okay. Um, and then, and I've, but I've been in private practice now for private practice completely for three. No. So, I'm not great with time. Either. Yeah. I'm not great with time either. Or like you say, like like oh, I've said, like I lived in New, I live in New Hampshire. I've lived here for ten years, but I keep saying ten years, and I never yeah. change it. I'm like yeah. it's ten years, but it's actually I think it's maybe fifteen or more. I don't really know, but yeah, yeah. I'm also not good with my left and my right. Are you not? I me mean, neither. That was the one thing that my parents got a parent teacher conference about that I (laughs) was having trouble in preschool remembering or knowing my left and my right. That's so funny. That's so funny. I wonder if there's some relationship between like, like not being able to track time and your left and your right. I have no idea why I thought of that, but. I bet there is. I bet it's like in the same part of the brain. Yeah. Yeah. I have to hold up my, do the L. Yes. I still do that too. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god or funny. i have to picture what i write with my left hand so i have to or i like picture myself writing okay one of the two are my go-tos that's so funny um <laughs> are you more visual like when you do your parts work do you see your parts visual like are you really visual when you do your parts work i'm actually a comedy i would say my primary is i'm very kinesthetic Okay. I really feel like I'm there. And then visual is like my secondary that comes in. Okay. So yeah. I wonder if that's part of it is like I, you feel your hand writing and that's how you connect to it's yeah. my left hand because I can feel my hand, what it feels like when I'm writing. That could definitely be. I mean, I'm making that I, up. I'm but. feeling you right now. I can go. <laughs> good, <ahead>. good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Okay, so you've done three years private practice, and then how long have you been doing IFS? I have been doing IFS for 
So, oh, sorry. I uh, asked you a bad question, though. That's a bad question. You just what? told me I'm not good with time. And then I asked you a time question. <laughs> what a terrible interviewer I am. <laughs> I think it's been like 15 years. Did you learn it in grad school? I learned of it in graduate school. So in grad school, we had like a intensive weekend on IFS. And I got really intrigued by it and felt like it really spoke to me in terms of the approach. And I was so intrigued that I really wanted to do my graduate thesis on integrating IFS with dance movement therapy, which is what I was in graduate school for. And so I found myself at a treatment facility um, that the eating disorder treatment facility that really uh, embraced IFS and embraced um, all kinds of healing modalities. So I felt really supported there. Um, and so I ended up staying there and working there and was fortunate enough to have, they hired Dick Schwartz as a consultant person. So I got my level one training from him wow. directly. Um, and then just had like him around at work. <laughs> uh, so I felt <laughs> That's really, funny. really fortunate. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and to have that as my foundation. Uh, yeah. So, and that was, yeah, I think that was back in like 2005 ish, 2005, 2007, somewhere in that range. You did your grad school in dance. Was it more dance or was it more art? Like, what? Tell me about that. Yeah, so I um, was in a dual program where you got like the regular counseling license that met the requirements for that um, LPCC is what it's called here. Um, and then dance movement therapy, um, a, a master's in dance movement therapy. And so that's the use of movement as a means of psychotherapy intervention. Uh, so in that program, we really learned ways of viewing how people move and how people hold themselves and how that might correlate to things that they're struggling with or things that they're, they have affinities for. Um, like being really curious about it, not that there's kind of this black and white, this means this, this means that, but there's a premise in dance movement therapy that the way you hold yourself, the way you move through the world reflects how you feel about yourself, reflects how you experience the world, how you relate to people. And so um, it can, it's like a valid form of understanding yourself and exploring yourself. That's fascinating. Um, there is a part of me though that wants the like, the list of like, oh, if someone has their, their shoulders <laughs> like this, then that means this, or if they like, walk like this, that means this. So um, can, you, can you give me some example, some just broad in general examples of, of what that might look like? Sure. <laughs> you just reminded me of my really good friend who she was she's a counselor friend of mine and um every once in a while she'd be like she'd strike a pose and she'd be like Jen what does this mean and she put herself in this like contorted posture and she she wanted me to like tell her what it meant <laughs> I think that's fascinating yeah. I, actually, I, I think that is fascinating. I mean, it's funny. That's it was funny. a little game that we would play. Yeah. We'd um, come up with stuff like really sarcastic stuff. Like, what actually what that means is an octopus um, <laughs> bit your foot when you were five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would kind of bounce between trying to really dissect it and then being goofy with it for sure. I like um, it. But so, like, an example would be the vertical axis. So, the up and down and, and your spine and our human bodies is really the line of our vertical axis. Uh, that is associated, how you hold yourself in the vertical 
is associated with your um, connection with yourself and how you relate to yourself. Mm. And so that's where things like sayings like spineless come from. Oh, he's spineless. You know, that, that refers to this idea of like, oh, he doesn't really have a moral compass. He doesn't really have a backbone, a quote backbone. So if you're seeing somebody that's really hunched and carries themselves in a hunched posture or what we would say is like the torso is retreated in that way, Mm -hmm. it might be an indication that, that there's an insecure relationship with the self, whether that's they don't trust that the world, that it's okay to bring who you are into the world um, or there's something wrong with that who I am at the core and so I'm taking it away and further from being exposed in the world. And then on the opposite, when somebody's kind of really puffed up and over, overly expressing that kind of tips over into what are they putting out? What are they trying to show the world right now? And typically it makes people kind of question where when you really just see somebody comfortable in that, that's where the confidence reads. That's an example. That's a great example and really interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thinking of it in terms of IFS would you say, how would you explain that idea of how we hold ourselves in relationship to parts? The way that I would kind of weave IFS in there is, is more of a, when, as a person's getting to know their parts, helping them understand how that part exists in their body when it's blended with them. So if somebody has this more kind of outgoing uh, social part, social butterfly part, you know, what does that feel like in their body and how does their, how do they actually carry themselves differently when that part's present and they might find themselves really wanting to reach out to people um, express like using their hands to express themselves more and just different, different feeling or different, postures, different energy that happens in in your body when different parts are present Mm -hmm. and really getting to know that and using that as a way to really help track. Um, My thesis work was how to use movement to help connect with the qualities of self and really feel that embodiment of self-energy uh, how that uniquely manifests in, in your body um, and exploring the, at the time it was just the seas, <laughs> um, exploring those seas and what that feels like in your body so that there is really that, that felt visceral sense. So what did you what did you find out in your paper and your research? Uh, so it was really interesting because the work that I was doing was at an eating disorder treatment facility, and so they have people that struggle with eating disorders have a very unique relationship to their body, um, and so even having somebody safely connect with their body when you have an eating disorder is powerful um, to have any connection that is positive. And I really found that, uh, that, that people could access embodiment in like really, really small doses. So um, really if you can, if you stretched for one, you know, did one stretch and found a sensation of like relief and calm in that and 
were, was able to stay present with that for five seconds before your brain started to criticize your body or go elsewhere, or want to exercise or whatever it was, um, that that was significant and important and a building block. And so really taught that like patience with the an internal system really needs the time to feel safe enough to let the person experience self um, and for self to be to feel safe enough for self to be in their room um, there's people I think people that struggle with eating disorders have a unique system in that they've their protectors really don't trust that it's okay for self to be around Mm. uh, and it takes time. Most clients and most people could access kind of calm creativity, curiosity much easier than things like confidence or compassion Mm. Um, so I found there was kind of a range, you know, not across the board, but that there were kind of go-to C's that seemed to be more accessible <laughs> than yeah. others. Yeah. So that was interesting. Yeah. All right. I have two. I have two. My mind is going a zillion miles an hour right now. So I'm trying to comment <laughs> down. Um, so, okay, here are my two. I'm going to give you my two questions. One, if I can remember them. One is... Um, if you have someone walk into, say we're not in the situation we're in and you have someone like walk into your office, are you assessing like how they walk into your office and how they carry themselves like as they walk into your office? And I guess that's kind of one question. And then if you notice someone whose spinal, like the way they're holding themselves vertically and I'm I'm like sitting right now with my like shoulders hunched over a little bit. How do you get them to, I guess what I'm trying to say is, or ask is how does IFS and not just saying like, roll your shoulders back as you walk through the world. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) So I guess I want to know about that. You know, as you're walking in and I'm I'm doing it right now, people can't see me, but I'm actually like (laughs) rolling my shoulders back, lifting my neck, looking around, if I was to walk in a grocery store right now, I would probably make myself really, really small. Right? Yeah. I probably would automatically make myself really, really small. Um, so to answer your first question, when somebody does come into my office, yes, I am noticing how they're carrying themselves, how they're moving or not moving. Um, mm kind of the range of movement that they allow themselves. And I'm doing this all though with like with that self energy of curiosity and no sense of like judgment, no conclusions being drawn. It's more just, you know, I have this frame of reference for the kind of different data that I can take in. And so I'm just kind of being washed with that and curious about it. Um, And really what one of the main things that I'm noticing is if the words they use are congruent with what their body is telling me. So um, if somebody is saying to me that they're really comfortable with themselves and make friends really easily and are really social. And they're saying this um, really with their legs crossed and tense and not moving. And the horizontal plane is one that's associated with being social. So, uh, uh, you know, if they're not able to kind of reach out um, you know, if they keep their, their arms folded in, I might be curious about that in terms of their bodies telling me they're not quite comfortable in the room with me, perhaps. 
or perhaps they're just cold, but <laughs> um, so, but their bodies, they don't want to get your germs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but their body's kind of telling me a different story than their words are. Yeah. And whenever that's the case, I get really curious uh, yeah. because the tendency is that the body's telling the more accurate version of things. Right. Um, and I might not even, and likely I wouldn't say that anything in the moment. I just kind of take that in. That I think that's what I'd say to your first question. That's really you want me to keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. That was a that is a fantastic. I love when I'm like I have this question in my head, and then I say it out loud, and I'm like, that doesn't match what I actually mean. But then the person actually answers the way that my my head wanted you to answer, so it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, that is, and that is so interesting to me because it's yeah. not just, I don't know that we're, well, I don't know that I was taught that. I mean, obviously we're taught about like affect, but right. I don't know that I'm really taught about the body. Like, and even that idea of, um, having space in my body or being embodied, I think is a really is a new idea for me or new since IFS is this idea of like, what does it feel like to be in my body? So with IFS, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say, like, I definitely wouldn't say like, okay, so roll your shoulders back now. <laughs> That'll help. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> um, I, but I'll use it as a way to track in the session. So if somebody comes in and they're pretty, you know, in self and their body's reflecting this self-wise adult presence and as we start to get into sharing something or they're sharing something and maybe um, more of a child part gets activated that has that kind of wounded like fetal position more posture and I and I'm seeing the person Mm. go into that and blend with that energy in their bodies reflecting that Mm. Um, I, I might just reflect that to them and ask them if they're in IFS style connected with that part, noticing how that part is present in their body. Mm. Um, and, and ask them what, what the part's trying to tell them through the body right now. So, Mm. you know, why does it feel nice to be curled up right now? What's what feels good about that. And, and that's just another way for the person self to understand the experience of the part. And if it's, if the part is oftentimes the parts kind of like, I don't want to be like this, but I feel like I need to. And so then I might encourage the part to like would it be okay to look at me and then just take in the environment and 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 invite the part to shift their position kind of one step at a time and see what it feels like that is so interesting because it's a fantastic unblending unblending tool and yeah fantastic like part to self relationship building yeah absolutely absolutely do you ever ask or or like lead someone to say, you know, I'm noticing that you're rocking a little bit and I'm wondering if you want to just let, just allow your, like ask them to just allow yourself just to go ahead and just fully be in that part, just fully rock. Like, would you ever like invite them to just deepen that experience so they can actually really notice that or? Yeah. Yeah. It, and, um, you know, it depends in terms of I don't want to completely lose the person. <laughs> and I work with people that will kind of dissociate into um, like being fully gone. Um, so I don't want to want that to happen, of course. But yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a way of witnessing. So um, it's just a, like the body visceral experience. Uh, there's the emotional experience that we help our clients witness um 
But if, if there is a part that has this kind of really way of carrying themselves or, or a way of soothing themselves, rocking is a self-soothing rhythm. And so just being in that and, and helping the self to witness that this is soothing for the part, that can be a really great tool mm-hmm. to then if, if, if um, something activates that part in the future, rocking your body might be a great way to send that part compassion. Um, Okay. Wow. Okay. So then, all right, that's really interesting. So you actually then could suggest to people that there are ways that they move their body on purpose in order to comfort a part or to be with a part. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's all kinds of kind of like neat ways that the body can break, be brought into building that relationship. Um, so certain ways you move your body, like rocking back and forth, um, or sometimes I'll invite people in the, in the relationship building with parts to, you know, is there, is there like a hand gesture or um, a, a simple movement that you can do that reminds you and reminds that part that you're connected. So um, right now I'm kind of rubbing my fingers together, really simple. But if you establish that as meaning, like I'm with you or I got you, then all you have to do is do that motion and the, the energy of that, that sentiment can be reached to that part. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that because sometimes it is easier for us to do emotion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. In your everyday life, you know, you're doing what you're doing and can be just a really simple thing to do. Yeah. Um, And when you can't find the words or, you know, yeah, I can't like this. shut my eyes and be like, okay, let me visualize my part. And, yeah, right, I just can't right, do that, but I can right. do something with my hands and, and shift my body in some way. Yeah. Um, it also feels like I then I need to be aware of because I am someone that like my I'm always using my hands and my body. I feel like my body is in constant motion, <laughs> and um, so even just being aware of that motion or or trying to like be intentional about my, mo- my motion, I think would actually be really grounding for me just to be aware of like, I'm doing this with my hand instead of like picking at my hands or my cuticles or <laughs> picking at myself or something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's what it would about that, you know, people that, um, that is there something about that people that like pick constantly pick at them, their fingers, or, you know, like kind of the picking at the face and all that stuff. Is there, is there some reason for that yeah actually um actually this is like picking and picking is also so there's there's established self-soothing rhythms that babies go through all of them developmentally and you can see this happen so there's let me see if I can remember all of them. Um, there's swaying, so that's the rocking back and forth. Um, bouncing, so you know when you see moms like bouncing a baby, yeah. it's like a soothing rhythm for babies. Um, biting and sucking, so sucking is a soothing rhythm, and then um, ringing. So when you see babies like all squirmy. And they're like, <laughs> I know you can't see me, but I mean, you can see me, Tammy, but yeah, so Jen is kind me. of like, her, like <laughs> it looks like her legs are going to the left. Her top is going to the right. Her hands are sort of like twisted and yeah. Yeah. That was good. So when you like, if you can visualize a baby when they're in that, like just really squirmy phase and their, um, their hands are going all different directions. Um, there that's a that's they're like trying to soothe mm, so we we develop affinities for different uh soothing rhythms as we grow into adulthood we maintain them some 
some kind of fall away and we have like one or two that are our primary uh, soothing rhythms and picking is, um, is like a form of biting, like the, the, the energy of it, like the, you know, when you bite, there's this just kind of short, uh, intense energy and then it lifts up. And so that same type of energy, you like bite down with your fingers and then pull. So most kind of nervous ticks that we see in people are actually self-soothing rhythms on steroids. Um, hair twirling is ringing. Um, people that like chew gum or like bite pens, that's biting. Uh, smokers, sucking. Uh, people that, uh, you know, rock back and forth, that's swaying or bounce their foot, bounce their leg, that's bouncing. So we're doing all these self rhythm, self-soothing rhythms all the time. And um, if you're aware of it, then you can really make choice with how you use them well would you okay so say if you're aware of it um like i was a nail biter like i say i still am a nail biter i'm just in recovery (laughs) (laughs) Um, but it's still like one of my favorite things to do is bite my nails and so um which is just there's another part that's like oh my gosh that's so disgusting don't tell people that um but i also will pick and so if if i um would I go to, so with this information, would I go to the part of me that's trying to soothe me by doing that? Depending on the circumstances, like if it's, if it's a nail biter and that's, you know, you're hurting your hands by, by biting at them and it's not the best thing to do, that it is an indication like something is feeling overwhelming right now. So let me check in with that part and then maybe that part will tell me if it's in distress or if there, if it's a protecting another part that's in distress and just being curious about what's going on, that's leading to the level of overwhelm that this, my body's feeling the need to soothe itself. And that part's help trying to help me soothe myself in that way for sure. I love that because what we normally think of when we think of these these like whether it's picking or biting your nails or whatever we think of like immediate behavioral interventions right like I've done so many like I I've done the rubber band on my wrist I've done the put Mm -hmm. hot sauce in clear nail polish and paint that on your nail like Mm -hmm. yeah I know I can eat that off. I like hot sauce. So, um, <laughs> but like, so none of that's going to, that's none of that's going to work. Like if, if, if you think of it, IFS wise, those behavioral interventions are not going to work yeah. because that part still needs to be soothed. Like yeah. there is some sweet little part that's feeling some hurt in some way. And this part is probably protecting it, doing this to try to soothe it and protect it and help it. Right. Right. Exactly. So the rubber band and the, the, um, that's probably why when people do like stop smoking and then they do like the lollipops or they gain 50 pounds or whatever, because it's like, we haven't really helped the part of them that needs the help. Soothing in the first place. Yeah. 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 about shamanism and how what shamanism is if you could do that um, absolutely and then talk about how that fits in and shows up in IFS sure um so shamanism is a way of life really that that honors and acknowledges that there's two worlds, that there's the physical world, the everyday world that we are living in, where I'm sitting on a couch right now, looking at you through a computer. And then there's the unseen world of the energetic. The the world of the energetic influences and helps to create our physical world. And so... So so it's not like these two 
just parallel worlds, like the energetic world is influencing the physical world. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And that, and so shamanic practices are designed to help be able to enter into and see and navigate the unseen world and access wisdom and help from that world to bring to the physical world. So in indigenous communities, that would mean like helping their community make sure their crops would grow at the right time. Um, So from very practical things like that to, you know, healing people and helping people. Um, So navigating between those two worlds and the people that were most able to do that were the shamans. The shamans translate, shaman translates to mediator between the worlds. Okay. Okay. And so would a shaman then be more like attuned to the energy in the other world? Okay. And are there like practices that the shaman would do or how, okay. So tell me about that. Yeah. So there's all kinds of different energetic practices depending on where you are and what indigenous shamanic culture you're in that are aimed at helping learn how to essentially develop that like a sense. So we have our sight, our vision, our taste. In the world of shamanism, there's this other sense that we all have. Um, it just isn't encouraged and cultivated in our culture, but this sense for attuning to and experiencing and, and honoring the energetic world. So to me, IFS is sham- shamanic. Okay. It's not that the shamanism shows up in it or IFS can be applied to it. My perspective is that I like the essence of IFS is shamanic in its nature. So what we're doing when we're, when we're personally doing IFS or, or facilitating helping somebody with their parts is we're guiding them into the energetic internal world. Mm. And all of our parts are different energies within us. And so we're helping to skillfully learn how to skillfully navigate the energetic worlds that's inside of us. That makes so much sense. Yeah. And, and the unburdening process is like this release, this shift in energy, the healing process that takes place that, you know, when you, the, the, when you bear it down, it's, you're shifting energy. You're shifting the energies that are happening. When you do an unburdening, it's shifting the energy inside of you. Yeah, it's releasing something. Wow. Yeah. Did you learn about shamanism at the same time or tell me about your journey with shamanism? Is that how you would say it? Yeah, yeah. Um, So I've – shamanism has been in my life personally for – a long time in mean since I was young. It was actually though when I started doing IFS with clients that it occurred to me that shamanic healing was like holding the perspective of shamanism was how I was supposed to uniquely show up as a healer in the world because when I would do IFS with somebody I don't know if you've had this experience I'm sure you have that there's just this like different zone that you're in and you can feel it and you're like I really felt myself with the person in their journey as they're witnessing what they're witnessing and feel the things that they're describing and 
and can feel when somebody unburdens how that shifts what's happening in the room. And I never really felt that palpable zone in when I was facilitating therapy with somebody else mm. in other modalities. And it was the same feeling that I would get when I was in my personal shamanic practices, like that it was the same zone. And I, like, that's how I realized, oh, what, like one IFS is shamanic or I, I feel it's shamanic. And two, that's, I'm supposed to be doing that type of work. And that's how I, that's how I am as a healer. That's my authentic way of helping people. So that really bridged me into considering um, embracing shamanism as something that I could facilitate for other people beyond my personal mm. growth and healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have experienced that. And it's almost like you can feel during I mean, even in the friending process, right? Even when people are friending their parts, I feel myself, like you're saying, like energetically shift. Like I drop down, I feel calmer. Like I'm not like, ah, you know, I'm not that. Like I am just so much, I'm still, I'm calm. And right. And if they go through an unburdening, it's like they talk about feeling lighter and I'm feeling lighter in the room and I'm feeling more connected and I'm, they're describing things and I'm like, I'm feeling really similar similarly <laughs> and I like my parts are just like all happy and I feel all this self energy and um yeah and I've never thought about it that way that like there's this like that we're it sounds like what you're saying is we're both operating in this different realm yeah okay yeah like we're exactly. both experiencing that different realm at the same time right right mm. And, you know, in my opinion, that's why people say that they experience such real shifts from IFS where they might have been in therapy for years and when they experience IFS have that testimonial of it's something different and new and actually got to something that I was never able to get to uh, before. Because they're not just shifting the physical and they're not just working in the physical world and realm. They're doing something in this spiritual, like energetic realm that, that, that feels more because if, all right. So if I just change something in the physical realm, like I just stopped biting my nails, let's say I haven't changed anything. Like even right now, like I'm like, it's still my favorite thing to do because I've not shifted anything in the spiritual realm or the energe energetic realm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in, in our psychological language, we would say that we're, you know, accessing the, the unresolved stuff that's still in our body that is trapped there from, you know, that was kind of, is kind of looping in our brain stem and lower parts of the brain and, and trapped in this, this hamster wheel in our body. Yeah. Um, and that's true. Like there, it's, it's different words for the same thing. Uh, accessing that thing that's beyond our intellect, beyond just intellectual understanding of, yeah, I know my mom shouldn't have treated me that way to really energetically in our body and our heart under feeling and knowing that you were deserving of love during that time yeah. is very different. It's incredibly different. Right. Right. It's the keeping it out of the head of just that, just that intellectual knowledge. Right. Because then you're going like at, like with IFS, like you're going to those parts that are trapped in those places, but you're saying that by doing that, there is this going into this other realm and doing this other like amazing energetic work. Yeah. And what's cool about if you're open to considering IFS through the lens of shamanism is that you can then kind of take what applies to your internal world and in the world of shamanism that all applies 
around us externally. So um, that self energy is out in the world. And when we are so blended that we can't access the self that would be most helpful. We don't have to try to do that alone um, because just like we're kind of like the larger self holding all of our parts in the world of shamanism, we're a part of a larger system. And so there's a larger self out there that we can draw from and bring in at any given point in time. And that might be the um, the confidence of a tree or um, the perspective of a condor. A condor medicine is perspective because it flies so high, it sees the big picture. Um, so there's all of this opportunity to have support and not feel alone and not feel like you're needing to like take care of your system by yourself. Because you're tapping into the higher self. Is that what you mean? Whatever that might be for you. So like in the world of shamanism, we are, we're parts of a system. We're parts of an ecosystem. Um, and that there's like, and there's mother earth and we're all like, we're all a unique functioning part of mother earth. And so within that, there's self energy that's making everything and helping everything stay in balance. And so, um, if you're open to that idea, then you can find self outside of yourself when you can't access it. <laughs> that actually makes sense. That makes so much sense, right? Does it? Okay. Yes, it really does. <laughs> I, it really makes a lot of sense. Just like if I can't access it, right? So that's sort of the bigger level, but then it's like if I can't access self and then I do a motion with my hands, then that might remind me and help me access self. It's like this, I think it's like the same thing. Totally. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing, kind of. <laughs> I know nothing about shamanism. That's why I was like, I want to have you on because I've heard this before about IFS and shamanism and like the whole unburning process being part of shaman. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't even know what that means. So I'm just so thankful that you're giving me like a little intro because I'm like, I think sure. it's so fascinating. And I think the stuff about the body, I mean, I think both of these both of what you're telling me are things that I don't know and I find fascinating. And so I'm hoping that listeners also are, so probably we've got listeners that are all over the place, right? Listeners that know exactly what you're talking about and more so and listeners that are like me and, and don't and, and are fascinated and want more. So what I'm feeling right now, and it's probably a good feeling is I just want more. I want to know more information about our bodies and I want to know more information about shamanism. If I want to know more about either one of those subjects, ideas, resources, or even maybe just your website to point me in, in a direction. My website is Shaman Healing Monterey and I do have, um, like information on there about the basics of shamanism and uh, also speak to the kind of this, I have, a, I have some blogs that do share more about the body and how it relates to, you know, us as people, like how we can use the body to help understand ourselves more with more resources in each of those areas. Um, really common shamanic Authors would be people like um, Sandra Ingerman, Michael Harner, Alberta Vialdo, Carlos Castaneda. I mean, there's tons. Great. Those okay. are those are very mainstream, great, um, accessible people. I think to uh, read. What I feel like I can walk away from 
pretty confidently is just um, with this new understanding of like asking people more about those things and then asking them to check in with their bodies and maybe what their bodies are telling them or like just starting to have more of a conversation about what people are noticing about their bodies or even me being more of an observer of what's happening with people's bodies as I'm sitting with them or even my own body and what's happening in my own body. Absolutely. When, um, if you're noticing things in your own body, it it's, can be a really great um, kind of tool in terms of, you know, how counter-transference works, it, that you can really pick up on a lot of stuff that you're experiencing in your body that might be really parallel to what the client's experiencing, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I love that. Good. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, too, with the movement piece that inviting somebody to, if as they're unburdening, if there's a movement that comes with that, um, that can really bring the unburdening to life. Yeah, I feel like that's a whole nother piece that maybe I'm just going to have to have you back on because there's a whole <laughs> nother piece that I'm curious about, about bringing move, movement into therapy yeah. and into the IFS world and like what that looks like. And yeah, so I think we're just going to have to do We're this just going to have to keep going. Yeah. It yeah. relates to shamanism too. I mean, there's just, it's all related. So. <laughs> okay. So we're going to have to do a part two. Cause that, cause I need to know about that. Yeah. I'd be happy to. So the, the question that I always ask people at the end is if you weren't doing all the stuff that you do and you could do something fun and interesting and exciting, no pressure, what would you be doing instead? I think that's a very cool question. Um, and I feel like different parts of me would do all different things. If I was going to be really honest one of the first things that comes to my mind <laughs> is really different in that if I, if like, if I didn't have to do, if I didn't have to work, if I could just choose, I might just be like a lady of leisure in that there's a side of me, like my Taurus side really would love to just be able to like wake up, have my tea, read, go do some yoga, come back, garden, mm. <laughs> make myself lunch, I, you know, just do like, just yeah. like, like self-care all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's I know a part I of me that's, yeah, that sounds, that's like, that sounds amazing. And then there's another part of me that's like, there's no way, but I, I get that. That, that sounds lovely. It would get, I know it'd get boring eventually. Like I couldn't do it forever, but I think I could do it for like a solid eight months before moving on to something meaningful. <laughs> That's meaningful though. I'm like, I could do that for a weekend. <laughs> I could do that for a weekend. And then <laughs> that sounds Beyond great. That, I, mean, I, I think if I, if that, the other side of me, I do have a lot of interest in like botany and, um, I would love to be a person that could go out into nature anywhere and be able to know what all the plants are and how they could be used and, um, and how they relate to one another, like the ecosystem of what's going on and how it's all working from that scientific level. Um, that would be really fascinating to me for sure. That is fascinating. There's this like um, older lady that has like a side of the road business that where I like buy my flowers and my mums and pumpkins and um, she's just this kind of like old hippie lady. And I went one time and I had a cold or something and she like to me it looked like she like went through the grass and picked out something and handed it to me and was like boil this in tea and drink it. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> that's amazing. I yeah. love that. Yeah, that is amazing. That's, I want to be able to do that. I yeah. want to be able to, to pick something up and be like, rub this on your foot. Right. 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 <laughs> I love that. Um, I feel like that's more, um, that's becoming kind of like more mainstream now, right? When people are doing that more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That sounds fun. I feel like both of your both of your dream jobs can actually really work together. 
you could do both of those. <laughs> they could, they could. I agree. I think this is a real thing for you. Real possibility. I'll, I'll see how that evolves. I'll keep yeah. it. I'll, I'll put it on my vision board. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, this was great. It was so nice to talk to you and just get to know you in this way. And um, this was really fun. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me and um, and for putting me at ease and making, you know, just Aww. it felt like just a fun conversation. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.